Um, there you go. Uh, my name is Kari Quas with the Northwest Neighborhood. Welcome, everybody. I was just saying that the college, I think, is open to students again, but on a limited basis. So they're starting to ease back. Uh, and I would assume that until the college is fully open, they won't necessarily welcome a group like ours in. Um, but I'm hoping because by April, we love to have our history meeting at the college so we can um, have a, oh, now I'm going to forget his name. If Johnny were here, she would know. <laughs> Um, and have our Neil Anderson. Thank you, Neil. Yes, Neil is going to speak about the history of the mills, and this this is a talk that's been postponed for a while. So hopefully we'll be able to get that done. So welcome everyone. We are live on Facebook and here. If you're on Facebook, I will post the Zoom link, and you can join us if you would like. Um, this evening we have Sergeant Turpening from the Everett Police Department. There's been some burglaries in the neighborhood, and so we're going to hear about those. Somebody had requested that we had a police officer here and get an update. And then also we have Eileen Simmons from the Evergreen Arboretum and Gardens, and she'll be talking about their Winter Lights program, which if you went last year, you know what it, we're talking about. If you didn't, you should go this year. Um, but also the Arboretum has a lot of wonderful events uh, in the springtime, planting events and such. Mother's Day last year, they had a huge sale um, and those flowers were gorgeous. So we're glad that everyone is here for that. So really without further ado, um, I would like to turn it over to Sergeant Turpening. Thanks for being here. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad to be here. So again, yeah, I'm Sergeant Turpening. I work nights in the north end of the city, which includes your neighborhood. Um, I would normally ha also have the uh, beat officer here as well, but the, she's extremely busy. We're a little short staffed tonight and there's a lot going on. So she's not able to make it. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about burglaries. I have uh, the numbers from September and October and it looks like there were six burglaries in the neighborhood during that time. And just to give you a little uh, uh, brief overview, um, uh, of those six burglaries, we had one suspect that was in custody and arrested for it. She has since been released. Um, and then the uh, second burglary, we have suspect information and the other four, we, haven't, we don't have suspect information for. Um, I don't know how much detail you want to know about these burglaries, but if you want more detail, I have a little bit more. I think just because uh, I wasn't aware of them until the neighbor let me know, but if um, what it was it just homes that were broken into and things taken or what was what was the scenario? Okay. Sure. Um, let's see. There were two on Wetmore Avenue, 700 block in the uh, 1000 block in the 700 block. There was uh, shotguns that were taken in the burglary. Um, in the 1000 block of Wetmore, a home was uh, ransacked, I guess, uh, disheveled. I'm not exactly sure what, if anything, was taking during that burglary. And then there was one on Rockefeller, 1000 block of Rockefeller. Uh, somebody got into a garage, did the same thing, kind of ransacked the garage. And again, I don't have all the details of, of all of these, but uh, so I'm not sure exactly what was taken during that one. Um, then at the Waits Motel, a change jar was taken that was considered a burglary. So, um, and then 1800 block of Lombard, that was where a female was arrested for the burglary and booked into jail. And then what's the last one there on uh, 700 block of Hoyt Avenue. And there is possible suspect information for that one. Possibly the, uh, the homeowner knows or is related to the suspect. Oh. Does that answer more, your questions there? Yeah, thank you. I just, just to kind of have a sense of it. Tim. Oh, I was surprised to hear that you had a, a female uh, burglary suspect. For some reason, I assumed that burglary would be like a male crime. Is it, am I mistaken? Oh, I don't think there's, I, I don't think you can put a gender on uh, these kind of crimes. Unfortunately, a lot of these crimes are associated with drug use and anyone who is a has a, uh, uh, I'm searching for the proper term here. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna say old school and I hopefully I don't offend anyone because I can't think of the proper term, but a, a drug addiction or a, a drug use disorder, that's what it is, is a drug use disorder, um, can end up committing these crimes. 
because they're looking for a way to finance how they're going to get their drugs. And so it can be male, female, there's uh, really no gender you can assign to it. And this, this uh, particular person, I believe she may have had some behavioral health concerns as well, which could be, um, of course, acerbated by drug use. Thank you. Maybe just a follow up then, Sergeant, is a, are these numbers unusual or something? Um, are they up down from maybe a month ago or a year ago? I don't have those statistics in front of me. I can tell you from just my, my personal experience, it doesn't seem like this is an extremely high amount. It seems to me like this is a, an average amount, unfortunately, but it doesn't seem like it's, it's up or low, or at least not to my knowledge. I could be wrong. I don't have the statistics. So that's just, just from what I'm aware of. Yeah, Holly? Hold on, unmute for a second. There we go. Holly, hit the button. The month in uh, 2018 when we all got burglarized, that month the number was 18. So six I think is pretty low for two months, correct? Yeah, that's for September and October. So yeah, that's yeah. So definitely at our wrong. worst, we were eighteen in an August of two thousand and eighteen, and eighteen nineteen was as bad as we got. Yeah, we're obvi obviously much better off than during that time. Yeah. I guess maybe safety tips would be in order if there's anything else people can be doing. I know the ring cameras or some sort of door protection camera device is always helpful as a deterrent, but is there anything else that you would recommend as we head into the darker season? Okay, yes. Um, absolutely cameras by far. I know everybody knows this already, but cameras are your friend and they're getting cheaper and cheaper and easier to come by. So if you can get a ring camera, you can go to Costco or to Best Buy. You can get uh, camera packages fairly cheap and have those installed and those will just help you. You can just keep track of what's uh, going on around your house. And if something does happen, it gives us, the police, a better chance to capture a suspect. Um, also, it, uh, meetings like this are outstanding. You get to know your neighbors and you have a way to communicate with each other. And so you can keep tabs on what's unusual in your neighborhood. Um, even better would be getting to know your direct neighbors to the left and right of you and across the street. And that way when, uh, you know, um, I know that's not always possible. Sometimes you don't have friendly neighbors, but um, the more you can do that, the more when you're not at home, a neighbor can see that something's out of place at your home and notify the police and call us and let us know. So mostly we would love to be able to have an officer in your neighborhood constantly. Unfortunately, uh, the way things are, we don't have the staffing to be able to do that. Our officers are pulled all over the city for uh, various calls for service. Um, so we are in your neighborhood as much as we can be, but uh, we certainly need your help to be able to um, be successful in catching criminals and prosecuting them. So the more that you guys can work together and notify us when things are out of place in your neighborhood, the better we're able to help you. I will speak for my block and my other neighbor on this block that we have a little text thing that goes on <laughs> anytime there's something that just seems a bit off, um, which I think is valuable um, to be able to, like you just said, know your neighbors on either side or across the street and start to collect those numbers so you have a way to reach out to somebody if something goes wrong. Um, one thing that always comes up and I always want to remind is calling 911 is appropriate, right? Um, if something doesn't seem right, it's good to call, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Never, never be a, think that, you know, I don't want to bother the police over something that looks suspicious in my neighborhood, because that's exactly what you should be doing is bothering us so we can go and check out something that's suspicious in your neighborhood. It's better for us to come, come there and find that there's nothing wrong than do nothing and something bad happens and we, and we end up just coming to take a police report. It's better for us to prevent it from happening if at all possible. And sometimes um, it could be something legitimately uh, a miss in your neighborhood, somebody could be casing a house and we show up, we determine that there's no probable cause for a crime or anything, but it's still that would detour a possible uh, break in down the road. So, I mean, the more of that, and not only that, it, it does help us to get into your neighborhood more. Not that we should use 911 as an excuse just to get a police officer in the neighborhood, but that is a added uh, side effect of that.
Sorry, I didn't mean to mute you, Sergeant. <laughs> Trying to get one of the other things done. So, yeah. Are we good? Yes. Yeah. So any questions um, for Sergeant Turpening? Or any other questions? Holly? Click the button. Uh, do you know question. About the arrest this morning at the park? A homeless person was arrested at the park this morning. Our park? Um, at Clark Park? <clears throat> no, here at Northwest Neighborhood Park, Drew Nielsen Neighborhood Park. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. Um, with, oh, it was during the few, day. Yeah, and I, I started at five o'clock this evening. So oh, okay, I could well, probably look up and, yeah. So, well, I guess maybe the specific question is um, moving, uh, addressing the homeless situation and responding to it in the park. So I think her problem was she did, she wouldn't move. Is, is the standard procedure to ask them to move and if they don't, then trouble starts? Yeah, the, it depends on, of course, the time of day because you know everyone has access to parks mm -hmm. and we, we don't have the authority to exclude somebody from a park unless they've been involved in some kind of criminal behavior. If that's the case, then we can exclude them from the park um, for a certain amount of time. And if they return to the park, they can be arrested for trespassing at that point. Um, but generally during the daytime or when the park's open, we, uh, as long as no one's violating a law, we don't really have the authority to uh, take any action on, with them, of course. I think they had a tarp and had set up a camp next to the chain link fence. So right. I think they and that have been there for a while. So maybe they exceeded the two hour limit or three hour limit or something. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that might be one of the reasons why they contacted her, and that might be a, a violation of the park rules. Yeah. Right. But I know in general, uh, Clark Park is in your neighborhood as well. Clark is that is correct? Yes, I Okay, so they're, they're, not, they're farther over. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, we have Marine View Drive parks. And how about any updates on people living in their cars at nighttime? I've been up quite a few times, and they're on Alverson overnight campers i call the park rangers if they haven't if they're there more than a few days but have you run into a lot of problems at night with that um i know that that does occur frequently we have a lot of uh unsheltered living in our city and they use their i guess their cars as their shelter and they get moved on from place to place mm -hmm. and so oftentimes they would they they, they go to uh Oh, now I can't think of the name they, on uh, Alverson there, the Alverson Park. Yeah, that's where they go. That's yeah, well, it, yeah, because there's a nice parking area there that overlooks the Jetty Island, and it's it's pretty big there, so it's an easy place and an inviting place for them to park. And down, of course, on uh, West Marine View Drive, there's those two parks down there, and well, we we call the Alverson Bridge, which is what's that, the uh, 200 block of West Marine View Drive. That, goes underneath the, the, uh, the little causeway there. Mm -hmm. We have had a lot of problems there in the past. Recently, that has been cut back dramatically. And I think that might be due to some of the construction that's going on down there. And there's less access to that area. But, so yeah. I've been thinking that that might be something that we need to talk to city council about is um, the rules and laws about living in your car and parking in parks. And maybe we need to look at what we have and make some changes. Would you agree there could be changes there? Oh, absolutely. There always can be changes that, that are made. And if we wanna make changes to our laws, of course, we're gonna to have to in, include the city council and the mayor and, yeah. and those sorts of things, yes. But I just see that that category is getting bigger of people living in their cars, and I think responding to them it should be a plan. Thank you. You're you're welcome. Does anyone else have questions for me? Yes, I have one. There was a large police presence on the 1600 block of Colby this last week. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm familiar with that. I was there. What was going on? That was uh, 
an incident where there was a little bit of alcohol involved and someone, I guess the charge would be unlawful discharge of a firearm within the city limits. So there was somebody who uh, discharged their firearm and while intoxicated. And I don't know if I should give out too much information without there being a public disclosure involved with, with that. But that was the that was the incident. No one was hurt. And uh, we believed at the time that there wasn't any likelihood that anybody was in danger. Any, uh, so we ended up uh, clearing from that area and from that call. Okay. So there's no immediate danger associated with it. Did you, did you have any specific question you wanted to ask about that incident? No, it was just like 10 police cars and I was just wondering what was going on. Yeah, we were being very cautious because anytime there's a firearm involved, we want to make sure that we use all caution. So we have the uh, the residents involved surrounded in case there was a need for us to do anything dynamically, we should say. Um, but overall, it was uh, a low probability of uh, danger to anyone in the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Yeah, You're good welcome. question, Jeff. I, I drove by there and I was curious myself. And then next door lights up with all the theories and stuff. So, yeah, alcohol and guns are scary together. Yeah. Um, yeah, not good. No. Any more questions for the sergeant? If not, it sounds busy as it always does in your department. Um, so, thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, and uh, Thanks to the chief as well for arranging that. I think it would be nice to probably have Chief Templeman come. He spoke recently at the um, Council of Neighborhoods meeting about the use of force rule. Um, and so it would be interesting to go over those changes and maybe have that be a different topic uh, for this group because I think it will take longer than a 10 minute update to explain that, um, but how the law change at the state level. So if that's interesting. We can um, have someone come back and talk about that too. Yeah, absolutely. We'd be happy to anytime. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Have a nice night. Um, with that, I turn it over to Eileen um, to talk about the fun stuff for a while. We'll balance. <laughs> Definitely different than people with alcohol and guns. Yes. <laughs> I would like to try to share my screen, Kari. Let me see if I can get the right file up here. You should have the power now. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that? Not yet. Okay, I think it sometimes takes a minute. Mm -hmm. It's spooling in the background, something like that. So let me know when it's up. Anyway, before, while we're waiting for that to happen, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm Eileen Simmons. Some of you may remember me from the Everett Public Library, but I've been retired from there almost four years now. And I have been active with the Arboretum and took over as president when Trevor Cameron, uh, who many of you may also know, stepped down due to uh, COVID pressures on his family and work life. And it's been an interesting almost two years now since I started doing that. Is the presentation up it yet? It is not. So maybe try one more time, but I'm wondering if it's asking you to share a specific tab or a window on your computer, and that would be the delay. You see that. Um, so I'm not, where would it show the? Let's see, maybe share screen. Let's try that. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Something is happening. Here? Okay, excellent. Excellent. I see a cone. Okay. So let's see, I need to change my view so I can see everything here. I think. How am I going to do that? Well, I can maybe just move you guys around. Okay. So the mission of the Evergreen Arboretum and Gardens Society is to create and maintain an inspirational arboretum and gardens accessible to all, internationally acclaimed and locally enjoyed for its plant diversity, original art, and education opportunities. 
And we take that very, all of those things very seriously. And I wanna give you a little background about the gardens, which were founded in 1963 by the Everett Garden Club. We're part of Legion Park, owned by the city of Everett, and we have maintenance support from the parks department. Where am I here? Admission is free. We're a volunteer organization that contributes about 4,300 volunteer hours per year, which amounts to over 350 a month. So that's a lot of hours in the gardens. And we also put in directly about $18,000 yearly in contributions in terms of um, plants, in terms of sculptures, in terms of pathway upgrades. So a lot of money that comes from a variety of sources to improve the Arboretum. We have 11 themed gardens and in 2020 we had about 6,200 or 62,000 visitors. There are 19 original sculptures and now that's going to be going up by one sometime in this month, we hope. And they're all by Northwest artists. And one of our services is um, docent tours, which we provide from, um, for all ages from kindergartens through senior housing organizations. So lots of contact with the public. And here are a few of our many volunteers, and I don't actually have a picture of Dottie Fickle here or Ralph Kloss, which I very well could, because both of those people have been longtime volunteers with the Arboretum. And you can see that we have all ages, all um, from a variety of backgrounds. The group in, on second from left are Navy volunteers. In fact, I was out there for almost three hours today with another group of Navy volunteers who are helping us get ready for winter tide lights. So the Arboretum really is a community um, assisted organization. In 2020 and 2021, these were really, um, 2020 was an unusual year for everyone as we all know. And at first, all operations in the Arboretum were stopped by the Parks Department and the city in the interest of public health. But gradually we sort of crept back in and, and did some work. And this year we took off again. So some of the things that we did, we had three empty sculpture plinths in the Arboretum in 2020, and they will all be filled by um, the end of this month this year. And, um, we also do a lot of grants. This year we have received almost $50,000 in grants from outside organizations. We funded an entryway sculpture that some of you may have seen in front of the classroom building on the um, east side of the parking lot as you come towards the gardens by a local artist, a young man who works at the shack called Isaac Furman. That was sponsored in part by a lodging tax grant we are about to begin the renovation of the small tree walk, which is a pedestrian pathway that leads people from the north end of Legion Park to the Arboretum at the south end. It was done originally almost 20 years ago as a cooperative project um, among a variety of organizations, including the PUD and um, uh, the Arboretum and the city to showcase trees that work well in our smaller backyard gardens. And in the course of 20 years, some of those trees have failed. Some of them have gotten even bigger than was anticipated. And some of the shrubs have outgrown their spaces. So we received a county grant for $10,000 to begin the renovation of that walkway, which will start in um, December with Groundworks doing a lot of the site preparation for us and then move in. <coughs> 2022 with replanting and a with the help of a $20,000 grant that we just received no, notification that we received from the Smith Stanley Smith Horticultural Trust out of California. We will be able to complete a new kiosk and signage for 
the pathway and a bike rack for bikers who come to the Arboretum and have no place to stash their bikes. So we're excited about that. We also received an economic stimulus grant, thanks from uh, federal money passed through through the city of Everett for our winter tide lights program. This was something that we started at the very end of 2020 when a few of us were walking around and thinking about what could we do in this year when we haven't really been able to do much at all and we thought we can light up the gardens. And so we took some of the money that we had brought in in 2020 and hadn't been able to spend on public events and bought lights and uh, strung them up in the Arboretum. And in a month when we usually see around 500 people walking through the, the gardens, almost 5,500 came through. So that was last year. This year, we're in the middle of setting up almost more than twice the amount of lights that we had last year. We're going to have three family fun events on the first three Saturdays in December from 4 to 6 p.m., which will um, welcome people into the gardens and handing out candy canes and hot chocolate to small children and small wintergreen plants, as well as allowing them to create luminarias that they can take home with them. And there'll be a gnome hunt in the gardens. Thanks to one of your Northwest neighbors, Tom Easley, whom you may know, who has made seven small gnomes that we're going to hide through the gardens and let do a scavenger hunt. So we are very excited about what's happening with you here and hope you'll know. We also in 20 thank you. Make the switch to online classes since we couldn't hold our in-person classes. And so we have continued doing that throughout the year and we will continue it through next year and then we'll be evaluating it. And we also have paired them with some in-person demonstrations in the garden and we'll continue. The other thing, we had a number of tribute trees installed in the gardens. These are um, trees. Here's one of your, another one of your Northwest neighbors. Some of you may know Judy Pascal and her husband, Dave James. Judy's mother died, her father, I'm sorry, I don't remember which one it was. I think it was her father died last year and she purchased a tribute to the plant in the Arboretum in his memory. So then some of our events um, from 2021, we had our classes of course, featuring the, the one of the things that Zoom, as many of us are, uh, I, know, I know a lot of us are probably sick of Zoom, things online, Zoom meetings, but Zoom classes have allowed us to bring in experts from other places who could not, we could not afford to um, hire to come to the Arboretum individually. So we had Lori Bowl from Portland talking about fearless gardening and Toby Nelson from Whidbey Island talking about container planting and uh, Laura Wilson from Seattle, who has something like 200 clematis in her garden and is a clematis queen. So we've been able to have these classes. And just as you're recording your um, neighborhood meeting, we also recorded these programs so that people who are unable to come when they were happening were able to actually enjoy the programs at a time that was convenient for them. The other thing that we were able, again, finally to do this year was to have outdoor activities. So we have partnerships with a number of um, organizations in town. We have a partnership with the Imagine Children's Museum. They hold a class in the Arboretum called Bees and Botany for preschoolers. And you can see the group sitting on the lawn, main lawn in the Arboretum on the left. We held a, another family fun event in um, August of this year. Um, those are always popular. We invite organizations that are um, family friendly into the Arboretum. So we had the Pilchuck Audubon Society, um, a musician engaging the song, the Children's Museum, the YMCA, Dawson, just lots of, of local organizations engaging people in what they do in the Arboretum. And this year also we have our, had our first ever sculpture walk. As I mentioned earlier, we have 20 or we'll soon have 20 original sculptures in the gardens. And we formed a partnership with the Northwest Stone Sculptures, Sculptors Association 
and they host they brought smaller sculptures into the gardens and displayed them in August the same weekend as fresh paint. So we had a little bit of um, symbiotic relationship with fresh paint in um, bringing people from fresh paint up to the Arboretum and allowing the sculptors to talk about their works with um, all of the visitors that we had. We had 500 people th come through the gardens in one day, thanks to that event. And we will be doing that again next year. The stone sculpture sculptors are eager to come back and we're eager to have them. So who uses the Arboretum? One of the things that's been really fun for me in a weird way during this time when I'm spending a lot of time there, but um, maybe more one-on-one -on -one and getting to see what happens. So artists, um, we have a number of artists who come in groups who work in the garden or who come individually. Bird watchers, there's an eagle's nest on, um, in, uh, on the golf course that you can see perfectly from the Arboretum. So um, George Bikowski is a Northwest neighbor of yours who lives down on Grand Avenue, or maybe he's Bayside, I'm not sure. Anyway, he comes to the gardens frequently to watch the eagles. We have children whose parents and aunts and uncles bring them to it and grandparents bring them to enjoy the nature. Dog walkers, we have lots and lots of dog walkers who bring their dogs through the gardens on a regular basis. Um, of course, families intending, attending our family fun days, out of town visitors. And one, one of the things that's always fun to see in the summer months, especially, families come celebrating events. Um, this young lady in the very princess-like pink gown is celebrating her quinceanera in the gardens this summer. And just last weekend when we were there cleaning up in the gardens, getting ready for wintertime lights, there was a family there celebrating the engagement of their son and daughter. And in the middle, the young man with the stroller and the small child is enjoying a book walk, which is another of our partnerships, this one with the Everett Public Library, to bring stories on storyboards that children and their families can walk through the gardens and read and enjoy. And we have one of those going up during winter tide lights. So other ways that people use the Arboretum, we, we host many, many professional and amateur photographers who come to the Arboretum to take pictures of senior proms, engagements, small children. Here's a little girl having celebrating her first birthday by getting her picture taken in the Arboretum. We also have Etsy shop owners, the two young women wearing the gorgeous gowns, orange and, and white, we just happened to run into when we were having a work day and they were there as models for costumes by a Stanwood woman who has an Etsy shop making these kinds of outfits. And she was kind enough to send me the final pictures that she took of them in the gardens. That same day, we hosted two drill teams, one from Seattle and one from Linwood who Googled where to have your picture, family pictures taken in um, the Everett area. And they ended up at the Arboretum and took their photos with the new sculptor that we sculpture that we put in this, this past summer. And then another fun group who uses the Arboretum are students. This, this group of young people were from the Stella Maris Academy in Edmonds, and they had happened on our website and on some of the downloadable lessons that we have for children on visiting the gardens. And so they had brought their entire school with clipboards and checklists for things to look for in the gardens. So it's always very fun to see who's doing what there and, and things you don't necessarily think about. So how we make all this happen. Our biggest fundraiser is our June plant sale. And we had to do a very, very modified version of that in 2020, but we were back in full force in June with an added bonus of the Mother's Day basket sale, which will be back in 
2022 and include fuchsia baskets for you fuchsia fans. So those are all things to look forward to in 2022. We also depend a lot on grants to do special projects. I told you a little bit about some of the grants that we are working on and will be continuing to work on and we continue to apply for those. Here, Dottie, here you are in all your green jacketed glory right in the center. Volunteers are super important to us. We have work parties many months of the year. Usually we take a break in November and December, but in January, but this year we're, we're, we've been out there in November getting ready for winter tide lights. We also depend on our partners and our sponsors. I've talked about some of them. We all sponsors, Lamar Real Estate has been an extremely generous sponsor. Sunnyside Nursery is a fantastic sponsor. Newland Construction has been a regular sponsor too. So we love our sponsors. The other way that we make all these things happen is through our members. And membership, I'm gonna give you a pitch here. Membership is pretty cheap. It's $25 for an individual mem membership, $40 for a family. And memberships help support things like our Zoom um, uh, subscription. It helps support our internet connection in the office so we can do our office work. It helps support the printing that we do for brochures. And it just it keeps us going throughout the year. And it has been two years since we've been able to have a membership dinner. And we are really hoping to be back in 2020 with an in-person membership dinner, and we would like to encourage you to think about coming. And if you can't come to that, to please join. You can do it online through our website, evergreenliberator.com. And with that, I'm just going to say thank you for having me speak. Um, you are our neighbors, and we would welcome you as volunteers. If you are interested in we're always happy to have board members. Dottie was a board member for years and has retired and is now emeritus status, I think. So um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and be okay. back in person. Thank you for that, Eileen. That's great. Well, thank you for listening so patiently. Well, I will just say that the Mother's Day baskets, I got a bunch for neighbors and also well, the mothers in my life, and um, they were gorgeous and lasted so very long and were so well appreciated. So um, it was a nice addition to your schedule. Thank you. We were really excited to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Any questions about the Arboretum or of Eileen or Dottie because you just volunteered for so long? Maybe, and I've seen Holly volunteer too. All of you have been wearing those green aprons that at the Everett Home Show yeah. once upon a time when that could happen. And it's like, oh, hey, neighbors. So <laughs> the raffle, maybe you could talk about the raffle, Eileen. <laughs> the, ra the raffle is part of our plant sale and it's another fundraising method that we have. Um, and this year it brought in almost $5,000 with his, which is actually, if we go higher than $5,000, we go into a new category with the state in terms of uh, gambling, and we're not going to go there because it requires too much. So yeah. we'll never sell more than 4,999 raffle tickets because of that. But uh, Trevor Cameron, who works at Sunnyside and was the previous president for many years and still is a, a hardworking volunteer for the Arboretum, is our raffle go-to person. And he is the one who um, twists arms to get some of the wonderful raffle prizes that we've had over the years. Great. So are, is anything else? If you have any questions or any interest in volunteering, you can contact us again through our website and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Yay, it's wonderful. Thank you Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, feel free to hang, hang around. Maybe the question will pop up in someone's mind. <laughs> it's been a long day, so I probably won't. Oh, OK, um, that's fine. <laughs> um, you know, Paul. Go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to thank um, the Arboretum 
mm -hmm. uh, Society and Eileen, all, all of, of, it's really a treasure. And so before you headed out, I just wanted to thank you and all of the volunteers and all the work that you've done and look forward to the Festival of Lights, uh, which opens up in what, just a week. December 1st. December 1. So uh, it's all come. every day, the month of December from 4 to 8 p.m. Yeah, well, thanks to, it's just great. It's really a treasure in the community. Thank you, Paul. And a quick thing. So I noticed that you didn't plug uh, donations, but you're accepting donations for your lights, right? Well, we accept donations always. Um, so on our website, there are, if you go to, to donate, there are options there. I talked a little bit about tribute trees, which is one way people donate, um, but also, um, we accept donations for the wintertide lights. And then we also accept that we have an education fund that helps fund the classes that we provide. And you can donate specifically to that if classes are important to you. And we have now, because we're redoing the small tree walk, we have a grant that funds the site preparation and we have a grant that funds the signage and the kiosk at the very end, but in the middle, we have the plants that we need to acquire to replace the ones that we took out. And so we have a donation fund for the plants and if you get on the trees. So if you're interested in seeing the small tree walk return to its, its former glory, then please feel free to contribute to that. The donations are always good. We're also, I, I will say, Patrick, since you, you've asked about that, we are looking into a donation box, but we wanted to be sure that we had something that would be secure given um, the possibilities of vandalism. And we think that thanks to the, the park rangers that we've identified one that nobody will break into and we will probably incorporate it into the kiosk that's part of the small tree walk project. But you can always donate online. Yeah, good question. I would think that the small tree walk is really kind of critical. A lot of people have small lots in North Everett. Um, and I mean, if they have a lot at all, um, that that would be a good way to educate people about what is available and possible on their lawn, which I realized that it, that from our last month's presentation when um, name is not Kim from the parks department was here was talking about that the city is potentially moving into more tree cover or they're looking at the canopy and our needs that are across the whole city but that actually takes not just public parks but it takes individual homeowners and people with any kind of land to also plant trees so what a great idea to have Again, it's beautiful and I encourage everyone to go walk through it's lovely and they're all signs so you know what you're looking at it's Wonderful space. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kari. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else before I head off? Let her go away from the screen. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. That's great. So I wanted to, well, Paul, I know you're here. So um, Brenda was unable to make it this month um, to give us the liaison report, but if you would like to tell us what's going on with city council, that would be fantastic. And you are muted, Senor. There you go. I, there you uh, go. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll pinch hit. I, I, I left my materials in uh, the council office, so I'm, I'm going to do this just from my memory. But um, and th that's always fun to see whether that works. Um, but um, first, I would just say that, um, again, uh, the Arboretum group does some great work, so I was just delighted that that they were here and 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 Kari, when when you and I saw each other at the sisters, I, I was having lunch with a guy named Carl Nelson, and Carl was one of the sculptors. He's actually been a major contributor to the sculptor work and the sculptor uh, exhibit that they did, um, which was really fantastic. And I'm looking forward to uh, more in the future. Uh, so, council, um, well, this is budget season. And so the public, uh, the, the budget process is well underway. Last night we held our second public hearing. We did not have any testimony on that, but if you're interested, if you go back to the meeting that would be, um, let me see, it would be November uh, 12, 
uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, November 10, um, you can, if you go online, you will be able to see a very detailed review of the budget. Um, and uh, the, uh, the staff did a really, really nice job of walking through all of the aspects of the budget. And so that was um, set forth for the first of those hearings. And then we had the, the second hearing last night and then the third hearing scheduled, I believe, for the 24th. So uh, that, that process is underway. Um, public safety issues are front and center uh, and uh, also housing issues. And very much related to that last night, we had a presentation and a workshop on the American Rescue Act funds, the ARPA funds. And uh, there is a proposal there for a number of options for the expenditure of those funds over the course of the next several years. Now those funds have to be spent. Uh, there, there are some uh, specific uh, requirements that those funds be spent uh, to offset the impacts of COVID. And so, uh, but, but that said, they can be in a number of categories, including uh, dealing with housing issues, uh, and dealing with um, business recovery, uh, dealing with public service, uh, infrastructure and so on. So those categories were outlined last night. So if you're interested in seeing uh, what that looks like, you can go online and, and look at the council meeting there. Now there was also public outreach on what we could do with the ARPA funds and the survey instruments that were used uh, were also brought forward last night in presentation. So uh, all that information is available to you if you go online to the City Council website and go to the meetings uh, and, and you can uh, scroll through there and find that. One of the early advanced funding elements for the ARP, what we call the ARPA funds, the American Recovery Act funds, it, um, was for the purchase of additional, uh, 40 additional pallet shelters. And so that, um, because um, as some of you know, those shelters are made right here in Everett. And uh, they, they do a the little, the, the company that does this work is located in Southwest Everett and they do a fantastic job. And their, their product is so popular that um, we have to get in line. I mean, you have to order things that, so, so we have an order and it's going through their processes now for an additional 40 pallet shelters and the city administration is looking for uh, some site or sites to locate those uh, as they come on board. So that was part of the ARPA funds. That's also part of the budget process. Um, I think it was also the meeting either on the 3rd or the 10th that we approved the human needs funding uh, uh, proposals. And so there's uh, information there for you as well. Um, the, and last night we adopted a parks fee uh, pro, uh, program so that we would uh, assess fees on uh, new construction and uh, those dollars would go to capital projects. And there's a process underway to look at where we are deficient in parks uh, in the city and those fees would be dedicated to new, uh, new and capital, uh, new development, capital development for new parks, uh, and and it is likely based on the allocation of park resources in the city that a fair number of those dollars would be allocated to the south end of the city. Uh, I, that that decision hasn't been made, but that was certainly the implication of the data that we saw in terms of where there's areas in the city that are less versus more uh, park rich. So um, stay tuned for more on that. Um, there was, there's been a lot of discussion about a proposal uh, that uh, the county has, is working on for purchase of a, uh, a hotel, uh, motel uh, in, uh, in the community that would be used for uh, housing unhoused people. And, um, that's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, there are some council members who have talked about asking for a delay on that project, but I think 
in fairness, most of the council members are asking simply for more information uh, on that proposal as opposed to a delay. I, 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 I can only speak for myself, but my sense is that the count, there, there is not uh, uh, an interest on the part of the council in delaying uh, the, the acquisition of more housing capacity. And uh, speaking for myself, uh, and I'll only, obviously I'll only be there for another uh, five or six weeks, but speaking for myself, I do not support delaying that purchase. I do want the information to be out in the public so that the public and, and the council and, and anyone can see uh, the transparency of, of how we're moving forward with that kind of approach. But we have a housing crisis and we need to respond to it. So that's, um, and, and you certainly heard me say that before. Uh, other issues, um, I uh, want to talk, uh, just, just let me just touch a little bit about, um, I talked about the park fees. Um, the pandemic uh, is not done with us. Um, Providence Hospital uh, is canceling elective surgeries. Uh, we're, we're not, this has, this issue has not gone away. Uh, and, and we're just asking everybody to get vaccinated if they haven't been vaccinated. And it, it, you know, it certainly helps um, not only you personally, but uh, you know, we have a healthcare system that's under extraordinary stress. Uh, and we need that healthcare system to do a lot of things other than just respond to a pandemic. And and uh, if everyone does their part, we can we can we can do better. And, and, and that was certainly something we touched on yesterday. Um, let's see. Um, I, I think I should just go to questions. I, I, I guess Akari again. I mm -hmm. um, it, it's budget time, and a lot of our energy is is going there. Uh, and the housing issues are front and center. Uh, and I certainly want to see us do everything we can to provide housing capacity. Uh, and, and, and with that means we provide uh, or work with social service entities that can, because the physical housing is one piece, but the management uh, team that works with that housing is critical to make it a success. And uh, we've, we've found that to be hugely valuable with, with the examples of Claire's Place and with the examples of the housing, uh, uh, Everett Gospel Mission stepping up to provide that uh, support resource for the Pallet Shelter Project on Smith Street. So let me stop there. Oh, well, uh, the, uh, we're moving forward on Sound Transit to stand up the Everett line. We're now getting into the real planning of that. Uh, which is very exciting because it gets down to the question of the specific alignments, specific options, station area planning, and beginning to, uh, we're not quite there yet, but beginning to tee up the, what's called the environmental work, which is the joint sepa nipa uh, kinds of environmental review that's necessary to build these projects. So uh, that's happening. Um, we're on schedule and on track uh, based on the revised schedule. Uh, the pun is perhaps intentional, but it is also applicable. So let me stop there and see if there are questions. Well, I have one question, and I think it was in the second reading maybe this week, and I'll admit I have not been paying attention to council very much. It's been very busy. Um, but I think there was something about gender, gender neutral language being added to the city code, and I'm wondering how that is progressing through council. Yes, there. Uh, uh, in short summary, um, that proposal it got its second reading last night, and I believe it will be up for adoption uh, on uh, Wednesday next. And it simply uh, it removes in our code uh, gender specific pronouns mm -hmm. and, uh, and revises that code. I think there was a state law that required that uh, recently passed. And in any event, I, I fully expect that the council will support that. I certainly have heard nothing to the contrary. Mm -hmm. And I expect that action will be taken on Wednesday on the 24th. Cool, thanks for that. Yeah, and on the train, someday I'm gonna ride a train. I'm just gonna, it'll be thrilling someday. <laughs> it'll be, and I know, I know Patrick and the Downtown Association and, and folks have been very, very active and supportive and, and not only, helping support bringing uh, light rail to Everett, 
but supporting the development and the transit oriented development and the kinds of things that will happen uh, as a result. And this is so critical for a number of reasons, but you know me, I, I, I can't come on to a meeting without talking about climate. And I think we just witnessed again, again, what, uh, what we're in for. And that means we have to decarbonize the system and that means build this kind of transportation system. That's what it's about. So I'm excited to see it happening. I've been engaged in it for many years and to see it start to stand up is, is just cool. So um, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and I know some of you have been great supporters and I appreciate that. Yeah, you're getting thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, thank you for that. Any qu other questions for Paul? Well, you're letting me off pretty easy, but I'll give a report uh, on Brenda's behalf uh, because she is a liaison and I'm sitting in for her tonight, um, but I'll certainly give a bit of a report and talk, uh, say nice things about Northwest as I always do, but also about uh, the Arboretum and, um, uh, and the programs that, uh, they, that Eileen talked about tonight. Yeah, thank you. David, you unmuted. I was going to say at some point um, I would want to hear from the port because I know we'll get into holiday festivities and I think people have started to see the ice rink going into place. Is that true? Uh, yes. And good evening, everybody. So if if you are giving me a few minutes, I, yeah, wasn't, I, I wasn't going to have a report, but I, since you opened up that can of worms, I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> give, give a report if I can. So if, if Paul is, if, uh, if, if city council member uh, Robinson is finished, mm -hmm. can I go ahead and give a report? Please go for it, David. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you for giving me a minute to always come and be uh, engaged with not only this neighborhood, but the other neighborhoods involved mm -hmm. in the city of Everett. And what I wanted to do is share a couple of things that the Port Commission is, has been uh, proud of as we move through uh, the holiday season. And one of the, um, uh, on Tuesday, uh, 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 November 16th, uh, the port passed this uh, 2022 uh, operating and capital budget for uh, the uh, 2022 year. And I'm very proud of that budget because that budget, it still showed no layoffs and in fact, we have jobs that we are hiring for. So uh, we're moving pretty good with that budget. And I just want to share that little bit with you on that part. Uh, we had a, also uh, a couple, about a week ago, we had a groundbreaking ceremony where we are, uh, we had the groundbreaking for not one, but two uh, new, uh, uh, well, one restaurant and a bakery. We finally got uh, the construction company to come out and start shoving uh, their dirt and they, they, they're they doing a pretty good job in doing that. And hopefully by next spring, uh, when you do your walk out there, you can stop by and have a donut or have whatever line of uh, uh, fresh bakery that they're gonna have. Or either stop and have a, uh, a rest, uh, eat a meal at Fish, Fishman Jack restaurant. Uh, that's the other restaurant I'm going to be going into. Um, and then I just wanted to say uh, uh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody uh, as we move close to the holiday season. We don't, we don't get a chance to uh, uh, thank everybody, but I thank you guys for being a part of uh, the 19 neighborhoods that are in, in, involved in Everett. Because Paul and, and, and myself and, and all of the elected officials, we like to hear what you what's going on in your neighborhood, and because you guys can overlook and see the port, <laughs> I like to hear what uh, you are so, But it, that can change as well, because I can go down to the low neighborhood. They don't have that much water by them, but I attend their meeting, so I can just to, to stay engaged with what's going on in their neighborhood. But I I want to also uh, speak on what Carrie said about the. Uh, skating ring, please sign up. Uh, those those slots are getting full pretty, 
pretty quick. It's going to be from uh, November 27th uh, to January 31st. And if you wanted to bring your family members down on the port during that time and, and use a skate ring during that time, this is the first time we ever uh, that the port commission, not the port commission, but the port have brought this company to the port. And if it goes good, hopefully next year they'll come back as well. So um, I just want to say uh, those few words and just say thank you very much for allowing me to uh, be with you guys uh, in from 2020 when we start engaging uh, neighborhood with the with the port until October when we finally started using Zoom of 2020 because we couldn't meet prior to that because of COVID. And then 2021, we've been consistent of trying to engage with the neighborhoods and that's what we want to continue to do in 2022. It might not be me, uh, uh, come. It, it could be Commissioner Beckman, could be Commissioner Stagger, uh, either from the from the port standpoint, it could be uh, Cat, uh, Captain Sophie that will come and 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 address uh, the neighborhood or whatever. But we, what we wanted to do is make sure that the port commission stay uh, engaged with the neighborhoods, and that's what when you see me, I I'm just part of the neighborhood. I I was a chairperson of the Delta neighborhood, and I just consistent like to be involved with the neighborhood. So if you don't see me, it's not that I'm trying to be disrespected to you guys. It's just that I wanted to go and see or hear what other neighborhoods has to say. But to, for that, I just want to say, uh, have a good Thanksgiving out there, folks, and be safe. And uh, go and, and use the port right now and do your walk or whatever and enjoy it. Because uh, the way it looks now, it's going to change. And hopefully, it it's going to be a better, but it's going to be um, more better than what you see today. But uh, but uh, just enjoy and 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 to have a boat on the on the port uh, where you I don't know where you park your boat at, uh, but in your sled out there, you can guarantee you have the best eyes on everybody property that own boats out there. So enjoy and the crabs that you catch. Uh, I don't eat too much seafood, but if you catch a crab and say, hey, David, I got one for you, make sure it's legal and call me and I'll come get it. <laughs> so, but anyway. All right. Thanks I'll a lot. I'll do that. I, I keep my boat in my garage, actually. But okay. Well, maybe okay. I shouldn't say that in a recorded meeting, but yeah. Yeah, anyway. but that's that's fine. But, you know, one of these days that could change. You might want to use your garage for something else. So. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> but anyway. That's fun. Thank you, David, so much. Yeah, um, I, I would. I agree, and I appreciate the port's involvement with the meetings and back and forth. And I think Kat's very approachable. Holly and just had had a meeting with her as well, and so keeping that line of communication open has been really great. And it's fun to watch for sure. Well, I want to say sometime when you when you believe that nothing can be uh, communicated, and sometime it kind of get uh, lost in that shuffle. Don't worry about that. It just bring it back up and bring it back up in a surface like through me or whatever. Mm -hmm. They took care of it. Those two people mm -hmm. that was involved in that letter, they took care of it. I was just a facilitator to make sure that the communication mm -hmm. take place. And that's what we at the Port Commission would like to see better, mm -hmm. uh, to work for all area communication. That's yeah. it. Holly, did you have something? Yeah, well, what? What Kat and I agreed on is that we want yellow lines in the crosswalks on the pavement. Mm -hmm. So whatever the port commissioners would like to input about public safety and just adding those yellow lines, she agreed they would be great, but she was gonna ask the parking people if they'd do it, the Lazoo Le people. Right, but thank right, you very right. much for following up with us. And yeah, I'm not gonna let this go. I need some yellow stripes, man. People are already <laughs> like that three way stop sign is so weird by the hotel now. Okay. And now people are coming along on that right side, and everybody's going, I don't know what to do. Okay, so yeah, we need yellow stripes over the crosswalks. All those people coming out of that apartment building have no protection nowhere. Okay, okay. well, thank you, thank you for your involvement too. You, Start to uh, 
dialogue with Kat. So um, mm -hmm. that's the end of my report, uh, Carrie, and, and thanks for everybody for just being on the call, but I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving to the last Ooh. person leaves. So I'm, I just wanted to get to that part. So. Very good, thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, I would like to give an update on Drew Nielsen Park. Um, uh, Tim, who's still on the call, and then Holly and I have been going back and forth with city representatives. And um, really, there's a lot of thank yous to go around from writing and editing and designing and dreaming and all these wonderful things. And my update um, to Holly and Tim, but then also to all of you, is that the way that the matching grants are working this year is typically when the city can jump in and just buy it directly as opposed to have a reimbursement in place, um, they like to do that. And so they will actually order the sign for us, Holly and Tim. See, we're all very happy, good. Um, so <laughs> uh, in short, so Tim did a lot of legwork in writing up the uh, biography of Drew Nielsen, who the park is named after, and then the why of why the park's named after Drew. Um, also wrote a uh, synopsis of the Northwest neighborhood and some of the places of interest and such here. Um, that went through a few neighbors, I think Coral and Holly and, and me and Jackie, and I don't even know who else. And then um, it went back to the city and then Jamie took a look at it and made some more edits, just fine tuning. And so now they have a designer that is now doing the sign design. Yeah, I know, see, again, happy. And so it'll match and be within park standards uh, for the signage. And then the piece, and then this, oh, the gal's name is Kelsey. She came out and measured the park today, park sign again, just to take a look at what I was trying to describe as I'm seeing it in my mind's eye. And she's like, what are you talking about? Um, that likely what will happen is that we will remove the old cork that's very terrible from the board, put on new cork onto both sides. That will be our responsibility. Um, and then the sign itself, on one side would be pretty much all information based in that aluminum signage. So it would just be on the thing. The other side, I think she's talking about having the headers we were talking about, Tim and Holly. And again, if you were at the September meeting, we had the handouts with what this would look like. Um, and there's one tacked to the board right now. Um, those would be headers on the sides. So you could then do your thumbnails and have the information below on the cork board. Does that make sense? <laughs> So anyway, the city's going to order that from Fast Signs. So they're doing the design with our work and input. So realistically, thank you to all the volunteers who came to the park in October to, for the cleanup, because we ended up having, I think, 65 hours of time times 30 or whatever it is. We'll hit our match to be able to get the money back as part of the city matching fund. So any questions on that? And isn't that wonderful, Tim and Holly? <laughs> I know. Thumbs up. Holly, what's your question? Or Tim, do you have something you'd like to share? Nope, just thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we might want to find another material, not the cork, because the cork doesn't really work great. So well, or something that you could tack into easily. That yeah. would be the backing. And then she's gonna have the signs built with screw or like have fast signs actually do the hole so we can just screw it into the board. So mm -hmm. those would already be pre-drilled. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Anyway, so we need to take the cork off that's there, take a look at it and decide if we want to put cork back on or something else that would work for the purpose of being able to stick put stuff it back on. It. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm on it. I got it. Okay, cool. <laughs> so um, the, the way that the matching grants work, again, the city provides $2,000 to each neighborhood, and they are able to use that for community project, projects, engagement, what have you. Um, typically, we have done the Whittier bike ride, um, improvements at the park, plants. We did the bike rack at the park through a matching grant, um, the cleanup, getting rid of your trash, recycling, all that. But we haven't been able to do some of those. So we've transferred pretty much all the money from the things we can do, like the bike ride, into the park. So we are doing our best to spend the money allotted to us. That's the bottom line. <laughs> um, one last thing on the park, too. Uh, in 2020, like uh, Eileen was describing, what can you do when you cannot gather inside 
well or safely, um, we changed it to doing holiday decorations at the park, which I think worked excellently. Um, so we're going to do that again on the 4th, which is, I guess, two Saturdays from now, Saturday after, one week after Thanksgiving. Um, gather at nine in the morning if you'd like to come and help string lights or holly or hang decorations on the pergola <laughs> arbor thing. If you are not afraid of heights, it's a wonderful volunteer job. And, <laughs> I did it. Um, I anybody can do that though. Anybody. Um, Tony uh, and Nita had provided the chair and like the Santa chair at the underneath the gazebo last year, and that was very festive as well. So come join us to set up, and then come back probably around five o'clock when it's dark, and we will turn on the lights and have cocoa this year, um, tea, coffee, whatever, and maybe some goodies. So very low key but easy for families. Hopefully you can walk there and just take a look at the lights or enjoy them throughout the month before we take them down. Yeah. So with that, if there aren't any more neighborhood updates, aside from Russ Castleman, if you're still there, I see Castleman. How much money do we have? Well, we are still in the $11,000 range. That'll but do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, again, thank you for people paying dues and just contributing. It allows us freedom to be able to do this stuff and take care of things that the city cannot. Um, the, all of the bigger plant stuff for the park will happen next year, so we'll talk more about that then, but that'll allow us to buy a few more strings of lights. Thanks, Russ. Um, with that, I wanted to lead off, but now this is the time of what holiday events are you going to? Um, that you would like to share that we should all go to safely. Um, and I will let Patrick talk. Yeah, go for it. Hi, well, um, as you know, you know, the city is making winter tide bigger every year. I think this is the second time they've done it. And it's quite, there's quite a bit more than last year. Uh, and much of that is gonna be downtown. So it coincides with Small Business Saturday. Small Business Saturday is a nationwide event. And it is always the, it's actually the day after Black Friday is kind of the antidote to Black Friday, if you will, to support small businesses. And um, so that's going to be going on. And at the same time, the, um, uh, the maker's market is going to be set up over by uh, I guess it's going to be more in front of Funco and by the Wetmore Plaza there. And we will, uh, the Downtown Everett Association will be there and we will be handing out our famous um, Everett tote bags. <clears throat> and actually there's uh, other ways as well that the DEA is participating. You might remember that last year we funded uh, eight new, uh, well, 12 new ornaments on the quadrangle at the corner of Hewitt and Colby. There was the eight giant lit snowflakes and the four wreaths on the corners. And those didn't come in until a good week or more after Thanksgiving. So they didn't go up when the tree went up, uh, but we have those now. So the city is going to be putting up the tree on the quadrangle this coming Saturday. And they're going to be putting up our ornaments and in addition to that, this year we purchased 10 more snowflakes. Um, you might have noticed on Colby, on three blocks of Colby, uh, between Wall and Everett Avenue, there are these big um, kind of gooseneck lamps with a flashing yellow light at the end of them. And those were originally designed to carry holiday ornaments. And they did 30 years ago, and they have not since. Well, we have purchased um, ornaments to fill those spaces. And the city has been busily working on recommissioning the power to those. They initially assumed that all 10 of them were still working and they found that many of them weren't. Uh, they have not guaranteed me that they will have all 10 of them ready by the weekend. As of Tuesday, they had uh, six of them and uh, I know they've been out working on it every day ever since. So anyway, uh, in fact, just this afternoon, I was uh, working on building a special rack that we can use to transport all of our giant snowflakes, you know, uh, so that we can push them around. Um, so there is that going on. And let's see if there is anything else. Yes. Um, <clears throat> 
first of all, our ornaments and things are actually, and uh, our flower program now uh, is under a, we now have a 501c3 subsidiary or partner organization called Downtown Everett Partners because the DEA is actually a 501c6, which we kind of need to be because of our clean team and all that stuff. Um, and if you wanna support things like us buying more Christmas ornaments and support our flower program, you can give to Downtown Everett Partners. And I will post the link in the chat here, if you don't mind me plugging that. And one more exciting thing that we're doing for Small Business Saturday is that we have partnered with a company called Yifty to produce a Downtown Everett gift card. And right now there are 27 businesses participating. And I just bought one a few minutes ago so I could test out how it works, but it is live. And it's uh, virtual, so you don't get a physical card. There is a $3 fee on top of whatever amount you buy that goes to Yifty. And you, um, you get a thing in your text or email that uh, literally looks like a credit card. And you show that to the vendor and uh, you can spend it. And so if you wanna keep your dollars local by uh, supporting local businesses by buying a um, Downtown Everett gift card, I just put the link in the chat there. And I wanna thank everybody who participated in the, uh, the Halloween scavenger hunt. I know that for a while now, our promotion committee has been working on various experiments with scavenger hunts. And you know we, we made the very difficult decision this year not to do trick or treat, uh, even though it's a very popular event. We probably will next year because children can now get vaccinated. Uh, but the scavenger hunt, we've received a lot of very positive feedback about that. So uh, I want to thank our promotion committee and every uh, everybody who participated in that. And that's it for downtown Everett. Thanks so much. I'm posting them into the Facebook thing as well. Um, my big plug, and I'm putting it in the chat, is Normana. Woo! The holiday bazaar is this weekend. I'm a proud Norwegian. Um, so oh, it's all <laughs> weekend this weekend, um, both Friday and Saturday. So I will not be at my day job tomorrow. I will be doing my other fun job um, from 10 to three on Friday and Saturday. And basically they've set it up. Um, masks are required in the building when you're up and walking around, there's limited lunch. So you can buy some lefsa and all that. But anyway, I'll have my photography booth, my cousin Julie will be there with glass stuff. And there's a bunch of other booths and it's just fun. And they sing songs in Norwegian and come on down. I'm happy they're able to do it. And they still do their pancake breakfast, but now they're drive through So everything in our lives has been altered <laughs> over the last 20 months, including this. So any other fun events that anyone wants to? Yeah, Carrie, I forgot to mention, if I had, I didn't mention it, about the holiday on the bay. Oh, please, uh, yes, yeah. For, for, de for December uh, 4th, that's a Saturday. Uh, there's about uh, 10, uh, 11 events on that day that the port is having. Please come out and bring your family out on that day. Uh, there's a tree lighting ceremony at, uh, uh, I think it's at uh, close to uh, five o'clock on that day. And uh, please come out and visit and bring your family. So I just want to mention that. Um, yes, it is a packed schedule, David. Thanks for sharing that. Um, looks like uh, free deck the halls, kids crafts, um, fire department, touch a truck, uh, ice queens with enchanting events. events. I, there's there's so many, and that's <laughs> that, and that's what we did for the summer. You know, we had so many uh, events down there this past summer. Yeah. I'm when I looked at this and I looked at Cat and I looked at Lisa and the Port Commission. I said we're pretty busy down here. So, <laughs> but it's, so. it's all good though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two movies that night, it looks like. Polar Express at 5 and Santa Claus at 7.30. Reservations are required. Yes. Yeah. And the lighted boat parade, which is always fun, too. Mm -hmm. but when, you, when you come to that, make sure you are dressed warm. <laughs> Last year, I had an overcoat on, a coat on it, under that overcoat, and it was still cold. So. <laughs> uh-huh. 
Well, and I do believe the fire trucks are going through the neighborhoods again. I don't know if Paul or Mary maybe know that for sure. Um, but I think I've heard that's happening. I don't know if they're doing the food drive aspect of it again. But Paul, do you know? I do not. I, I don't I don't know if that's a happening or not. It was uh, very popular last year and Santa got better at his timing as the days and weeks went on. Um, but I think it, kids, it was really fun for them to see the trucks and Santa and all that kind of stuff. And they raised a lot of food, if you can say it that way. So it was a good event for everybody, I think. So happy Thanksgiving, says Holly. It's good. Well, I mean, it is 821. We've exceeded, but it's probably fine. It's our last meeting of the year. I do hope to see people on the 4th for holiday decorating and then stay tuned. We'll announce if some, when something has happened at the park for the sign. Um, but ideally that will be taking place in December. So we'll get that done before the end of the year, which is great. Um, and then we'll begin again in January. I don't know the date offhand. I think it's the 20th for some reason of 2022. Um, and hopefully we'll get the mayor at one of those early meetings since she was unable to come this fall. So we'll likely be on Zoom. Kids, um, still go get vaccinated, um, get your boosters, um, keep your holiday parties small unless you're vaccinated, I guess, really is kind of the rule. So yeah, any other closing thoughts? No, thank you for being here. Thanks for all the work that everyone does to keep this neighborhood awesome. And happy holidays, everybody. Be safe out there. Yeah, happy holidays indeed. And we'll see you in the new year or next week, next month. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kari. Thank you, Kari. Thank you, Kari. Thank you, Kari. Thanks, thank you. Kari. You're welcome. Bye -bye. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.